Uh, welcome, folks, to uh, our first ever virtual art show here at South Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve. We're on the Oregon coast. Uh, we are located on the southern Oregon coast, uh, south of Coos Bay, South Slough, is a 5,000-acre protected area. It's the first National Estuarine Research Reserve in the country, dedicated back in 1974. And we are celebrating this year our 40th anniversary, which is very exciting. And uh, I'm also extremely excited that we have someone here with us today who's agreed to be our first uh, virtual artist. I guess she's not a virtual artist. I can assure you she's right there uh, for real. <laughs> Uh, but Kimberly Worcester is joining us today, and Kimberly's art show is going to kick off our 40th anniversary. So um, what I want to uh, start out by offering uh, Kimberly is thanks for being a part of this. Yeah, trying this out. Uh, we've never done this, this particular. We've been live before, uh, but never live uh, in this way doing a virtual art show. So uh, today... Uh, because this is the first time through, we don't have a lot of opportunity for interaction with uh, viewers, uh, but we are going to invite somebody into our midst here uh, who is our uh, public involvement coordinator, and it'll take me just a second to send an invite to Deborah. And uh, Deborah Rudd, if you don't know her, is an absolutely fantastic uh, member of our staff who does our public involvement program. And Deborah will be your advocate today. So all of you viewers out there, uh, if you can think about Deborah as uh, the person who might ask the question for you, um, we can we can see. I see we've got uh, some people watching uh, through Google Plus, but hopefully Deborah will join us here and we'll share out uh, her video so that we can see her. But in the meantime, Kimberly, let's let's dig in. So um, I have uh, hopes that we can discover a little bit about your background, what got you into uh, creating this lovely artwork, uh, what how you do this. So maybe you're giving up a few of your secrets at home. <laughs> but, um, and then uh, finally, we'll appreciate some of the the work itself and talk about how you created that. So um, first off. Uh, just how did you get started in creating art? What was the, the motivation for you? And, you know, where did, where did you begin this journey? Oh, I began at the beginning. Um, when I was very small, uh, we lived on a farm in southwestern Montana. I was born in Missoula, Montana, actually. Oh, wow. A lot of people really know where that is. Sure. It's kind yeah. of a destination. And um, we had lots of different kinds of animals, and my brother raised and trained racehorses. So even though I was fond of the other animals, horses were my favorite. That's always the case with yeah. young girls. And so, um, and in nature in general, um, you know, all of my siblings and myself were always encouraged to to look around and to appreciate uh, the beautiful surroundings because Western Montana is hard to beat. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. Yes, it is. Very and yeah. very different from the Oregon coast, very, however. A lot yeah. colder. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, when, when the geese would fly over in the migration or ducks, or, you know, we, we were encouraged to go out and make a note. You know, there they go, and happy trails, you know. And so uh, my folks had um, been ranchers before we moved into town, before my time. Mm -hmm. And they had, as a result, a number of really, really good friends out way in the country, way, way out. And uh, we would go on the weekends to go and visit them. And I remember riding in the back seat without any coloring books or toys of any sort. My nose would be glued to the window looking oh, at the yeah. scenery. That sure. was my entertainment. Sure. So I, I, I appreciated all the things then that I do now. And um, I always had a pencil in my hand. All of my... My brother, my brother, and all of my sisters uh, could draw, and I was the only one who really pursued it. But um, I was always drawing everything in mm. front of me, and, and I really, as I mentioned, became fond of the horses. And my brother encouraged me to get it right. You know, the ears, the eyes, all so of the that's tab. Where yeah. Capturing form yes. became a priority mm -hmm. as you yeah. thought about um, the very specific Absolutely. ways that these animals appear, or the these breeds. plants, the mm -hmm. different breeds. Yeah. So what? How did you get? West of Montana, you're on the Oregon coast well, now. So. Uh, in 1995, um, I actually my husband and I were living about an hour southwest of Bozeman, and um, just before we moved down here, I painted my first real bird. 
It was actually a prairie hmm. falcon that I, I, I oh, copied off of. Bird. Yes, I yeah. copied it off of a off of a calendar because I didn't have any of my own reference, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to see if I could do it. You know, it's kind of a challenge, of course. And, sure. And my brother was getting married, and I wanted to do something really special for him. I mean, he's my brother, of course, I love him, but he's a very good friend of mine too. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was really encouraged with the turnout, and and um, my husband. I had always been encouraged by everybody to to do what I was doing, you know, drawing and everything, but um, never really encouraged to pursue it. And my husband Scott looked at that and he said, "You might want to do something with this." He has yeah. a very, very keen eye, very dis uh, discriminating eye when it comes to wildlife and art. And he's he's been out in the woods a lot and very observant. So I trusted his judgment, and he's he's been unfailingly. I'm glad he had that judgment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's he's, me. Anyway, so we moved down to the Elk River. Oh, in 1995, wonderful. just yeah. north of Port Orchard. And where I had been before, you know, it, we hadn't had the trees up close to the house. We didn't have the songbirds. Mm -hmm. And so down on the Alp River, everything was just right here. I mean, to, to listen to a winter wren or a black headed grosbeak, speak, I mean, these sounds were new to me. Yeah. And I was missing the symphony. That, you know, I, I had actually learned to play the cello and had been a musician for some years. And so um, the birds kind of filled that void. Yeah, and, and do you know where the estuary for the Elk River is? You know, yeah, down sure, near yes. Cape Blanco, yes, right? It's wonderful. So that's called a blind estuary. Mm -hmm. Do you know that? And it, it becomes blind to the ocean. You probably know that in the summer months. There's just not enough rain there. So, oh, wow. Yeah, Very so, cool. It's a beautiful area. I'd love a rendering someday, maybe, of a blind I estuary. Have some really, really, nice. really neat drawings that Very worked cool. out of, of that area. It was down there mushroom picking. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, phenomenal so, area. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I want to touch on another aspect of your artistry. You're a musician. Yes. So how does uh, your visual art relate to the music that you play? The first experience I ever had with that was, oh, I don't know how old I was. I was very small when I started listening to classical music, um, Beethoven Brahms List. Um, I was very, uh, very fortunate to get to hear the Missoula Symphony at a very young age and just hearing them tune just just wired me. Yeah. <laughs> I have to be part of that, you know. Yeah. So I learned to play cello and did uh, become cello, part of that. Lovely yeah, instrument. Very beautiful instrument. And I, I began playing cello when I was 10. But before then, um, when I was drawing like mad, before I actually was introduced to, to playing music, um, I had all of these action images in my head of, of cowboys and Indians and um, Bronx, you know, bucking Bronx mm -hmm. and all these things. Mm -hmm. And somehow I ended up just with a block, a, a, a painter's block. I couldn't, I couldn't express it. I couldn't get it out on paper. It was very frustrating for me. And somehow I can't remember who bought it, but a, a LP a recording of Aaron Copeland oh, ended up sure. in our house. And <laughs> he, oh, I, you know, I heard Billy the Kid and Rodeo and Appalachian oh, nice. Spring. <laughs> yeah, Appalachian And I was like, yes, oh, it's piece. my favorite. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that piece. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that music, it it was just like the floodgates were open. It was amazing. Yeah. And all good. of a sudden, I, all these images started just bubbling out, and mm -hmm. that was my first experience. It was really profound. Cool. And I use music to this day. For that. So, so to me, that's that's very exciting. Um, you know, when I think of the visual arts, I tend to think, how is that? Uh, where is that motivation coming from? And and you hear something sometimes when you're looking at these things. I can't help but when I look at your paintings, I'm hearing that bird. Oh, you know, if right. I see a bird, I kind of hear that in my head. Um, can we talk a little bit about the process of Absolutely. how you make artwork? Yeah. So, what I do. Um, how you know when you uh, begin to make a piece of artwork? What where is the beginning? Where is this first? Nugget this this moment when you say this needs to be visual artwork. That happens in the field. Happens that in the happens field. when I'm outside. I do paint from reference photos. I take my own reference work. Yes. But there is no substitute for spending time out. And you don't always have to have a camera in hand. I mean, it's handy, mm -hmm. obviously, because birds don't hold still and the light changes. So it's a very necessary sure. tool. But there's no substitute for sitting there just soaking it all up. The mm -hmm. whole package, the day, the, the weather, the, the humidity, everything. Mm -hmm. And so that's where that starts, that initial inspiration. And I do take, a, there, there's no such thing as too much information. I have a lot of images. Hmm. <laughs> I have no idea how many. And so um, 
I began going through those, and I remember, see, when I'm taking those pictures and, and we're doing sketches in the field, um, I'm coming from the same place, no matter what I'm doing, because I'm composing. Sure. I'm collecting that work with a purpose in mind, and so um, the, the photos are very inspiring for me, too. It doesn't have to be a sketch. And so um, when I begin to go through them and sorting them through, I, I, I pick out oftentimes images uh, or, or, or components of images from several different pictures. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes five, six pictures, will, you know, different photos will have parts of them go into the same painting. And you ha I have to be very careful, of course, to, to match things like light and season yeah. and make sure the bird would be seen there at that time. I mean, those things are all very critical because I have a number of clients who will go home and grab their bird book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no mm -hmm. pressure. Right, right, right. Uh, so, but I would paint it that way anyway because that's what I want to share with people. Well, in, in, you know, in the uh, work that you do, when I look at it, I recognize that you have this tremendous eye for detail, but you also are able to convey impression. Uh, the the work isn't simply a realistic rendering, cold, stark. Here's the animal. It, you know the beak is exactly the right length. Although it ultimately it probably is exactly oh, the yeah. right length. Yeah, but um, but also uh, lighting, mood, textures. Um, it it conveys something that is emotional, really to me anyway, Good. about the uh, about the animal uh, or or even the scene. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, so, so how do you go from, you know, I want this to be accurate, but I also want to convey that that spirit. Maybe that's that's the je ne sais quoi, you know. I, that's the well, piece that we can't say what it is. But. I actually, I actually start with. It's a very good thing coming from a, a compositional point of view, to to use a, a design driven idea, mm -hmm. okay? Because you don't. It, no picture is going to work unless it has a good design. I don't yeah. care how well it's done. It really it has to have a good design. So with that in mind, my work actually is subject-driven. And I've learned recently to combine the two. In fact, mm -hmm. it would be a, kind of a neat teaching thing for me to pursue because I've been approached about teaching. And I think that would be a useful thing for a lot of people because design is really interesting. And I love composition and design, but it has to have that subject in sure. there because simple shapes won't do it for me. And I have spoken to a lot of artists who are of a like mind. They need some life in there, not just the shapes. And the yeah. shapes are fine if that's what you want to do, but it's just not where I'm coming from. Sure. So um, I don't want to lose my train of thought here because this is such a loaded issue. Well, and, <laughs> and I'm going I'm to move <laughs> your train onto a different I, track here yeah. in a moment. So. Yeah, but I, I start with a thumbnail sketch. You know, very small, like okay. one to two inches, very simple idea, um, the basic shapes and how they relate to one another. And if, it's, mm -hmm. if it feels good in the pit of my stomach, you know, mm -hmm. and basic balance and symmetry and that type of thing. We don't want things too symmetric. Right. You know? right. And and I do a tonal study. You know, oftentimes just black and white. I have to tell you, you showed me one earlier today, and I went, "Oh, that's right, tonal study." I can't. Yeah. That's like way back in college. Yeah. The one art class I think I took <laughs> or something. Uh, so it was nice to see tonal study. Very effective. Uh, part of yeah. 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 Do you um, you brought along a couple of sketchbooks here, yes. and I would love to share with our viewers um, some of that work. And we brought this little easel out, um, so when we get comfortable with it here, we can adjust the camera. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah let's. Uh, sorry about this, folks. We'll move that down a little bit like that. I okay, think we'll we can ignore see this one well. up here because this is a different. Different study. Yeah, different study. But okay. this little black and white here became this, became the painting behind this wow. study. So, and this is actually quite a lot larger. This developed drawing here is quite a lot larger than I usually do. I usually don't you know, get much larger than this little image up here, maybe a four by six or something along that line. But I start oftentimes with a simple line drawing. Mm -hmm. Just to see, as I mentioned, how the shapes will uh, interact on the picture plane, and and then do a, a basic tonal study like this. Sometimes I work it up to a little, you know, three to five tones uh, of shade, shades of, of from white to black. And um, you had a question. You wanted to yeah. Answer that. I don't want to lose that question. Go ahead oh and ask. man, there is. So uh, a couple of things is uh, I want to talk about investment. In other words. 
the investment you make in the sketch versus the investment made in the painting. Right. But but also these tonal studies in the play of light. So light is so critical right. to the, the focus, to the interest in the image. Mm -hmm. So is that you use the tonal studies to start to build your yes. your space for yes. the light. Yes, and and the light is, is you know they have have to have that impact. Yeah, the light the dark. Yeah. Well, in this I, I want to point out, you know, this even though it's not very detailed mm -hmm. at all, I can see you've got the composition already figured in your mind is where are these major components going to live in the overall composition of the image. Yes. Uh, and that creates interest right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, even though this is undeveloped, um, there's there's some interest instead of, you know, boom, that bird's right in the center. It's not right in the center. It almost looks to me, though, like in the finished composition, maybe you move the bird a little bit. You play mm -hmm. around with mm -hmm. that. I do. I play around with that. And when I and, and you mentioned a, a very good point that would be good to expand on a little bit, the, the investment of time. As I mentioned, I usually do not spend this amount of time on a drawing. I mean, this is pretty, this is almost complete. And I actually caught myself a couple times with a couple other paintings investing so much time in this drawing that I didn't have anything left for the You're painting. You were done, yeah. You know, right. <laughs> and I would encourage everybody, you know, especially the, the newer artists who maybe are a little less familiar with their own working process just because they haven't done it for very long. Listen to yourself and find what works for yourself. If it if it works for you to develop fully and then paint it, great. But if it doesn't, you know, you have to find what works best because it really saves a lot of time and frustration sure. and energy. Yeah. Um, so what I'll do at, at a point like this is, as I mentioned, oftentimes they're a lot smaller, somewhere between this size and this size. Actually, probably closer to this size. But and and they're not very um, detailed at that point, but they are to scale. Mm -hmm. Every all of the components are where I want them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you can see that here. Yeah, so what I'll do at that point, and even did in this case actually, because the painting is is larger, instead of trying to redraw it freehand, mm -hmm. because I've already done all the drawing I want to do, and I don't want to burn out on that, I will then put it on my flatbed printer, either in one piece depending on the the resulting size that I want, or I will even cut it in quarters and blow each quarter up. Oh, sure. Okay, I'll, I'll mm -hmm. just play with it until it's right. And then I'll transfer it with tracing paper to whatever mm -hmm. you know, paper or sanded paper, whatever you know, medium that I'm happen happening to use. It could be on watercolor paper or sanded paper, um, a canvas. So anyway, um, then I'll transfer it, and all that drawing is done. And I will go in to the surface, uh, the support surface, and I will add the details for the bird's eyes and the feet. Hmm. Those feather placements, you know, and I do actually, I a point I would like to make specifically about birds, I have an acquaintance who mentioned to me that, and I don't remember the title of the book, but she said she had a book that uh, mentioned all of the, the numbers of feathers for each bird that, you know, I oh, thought, oh yeah. my gosh, well that's fine, but you know, you need to paint what you're seeing because all of those feathers are not going to show right, all the time. Right. If the bird's head's turned, you know, you're going to have some separation here, you know, on the back side of the neck. I mean, you just really have to be observant and not paint what you think you should see. Mm -hmm. You have mm -hmm. to watch that. What's really there. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that's a, a critical point, I think. And, you know, before we're, we're going to jump to the painting here in a moment, um, but uh, one of the things that we talked about a little bit is uh, with a piece of artwork, there is a point where maybe you want to say, I'm done. And with the sketch, that you've talked about that a little bit, is there's the investment that you make in that sketch. Um, if you had some advice, I'm going to sort of jump ahead to advice for the artists. There may be some artists out there or some folks who would like to try. Uh, what, you know, how do you, what would you recommend that they, it seems like they would start with a sketchbook and mm -hmm. just start to sketch what you really see. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, you know, what would you recommend for them? Where, where is that jumping point to say, okay, back off now and work on your your painting? You know? To to answer that, I'm going to back up just a hair and point out the fact that I will take this. Usually, they're on the same page as these two images are. Mm -hmm. I will have it somewhere in my studio so that it is present as I'm painting. You know, uh, I have okay. my reference work, my photographs and stuff that I work from, which are are critical. Sure. But um, I want this to be in the back of my mind as I'm painting so that I remember that initial inspiration because mm -hmm. I want to getting getting a final result that looks 
like you want it to look. Yes, I want this to look like a bush tit, not a heart. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's mm -hmm. a very good thing yeah. to, have what, to have it look right. But you want it to feel right. And there yeah. is a difference there. Sure. And that might take some practice. It did for me. To, to zero in on that and be able to to find that place how mm -hmm. you want it to feel mm -hmm. and so having this present you know I don't have to be looking right at it but it's it's kind of in my peripheral vision mm -hmm. and I'm very much aware of how I want this to feel and so I, when I reach that three quarter point or wherever when I have all of those basic shapes in I have my my edge edges where I want them edge control is great for creating depth and, and believability mm -hmm. and and um, Tonal values for three dimensionality, you know, is wonderful. What it's so I have to stop you here for a second. <laughs> you you tell me you have no formal training, and yet you have such a sophisticated lexicon of <laughs> describing this artwork. I can yeah. tell this is your this is your life, or at least a part of your life, yeah. because you're a talented musician as well. But um, you know, that's that, it's just fascinating to me anyway that you know you you well, found something that clearly mm -hmm. uh, it's what drives. Uh, this beautiful artwork that you make, but you you've got a very sophisticated level for someone who has lot. no formal training. You read a lot. <laughs> I okay. read a lot. I have a okay. small, uh, but but very very high quality library. I have a keen mm -hmm. sense for what works for me. When mm -hmm. I see somebody's teaching method yeah. that works for me, you know, I just I nail it. I, I get that <laughs> book right away before it you know might go out of print or something. And um, I refer back to things. That's a very good point that I would like to make because based on whatever I've been painting, if I go back to an article or a book that I read in, you know, two or three years ago, mm -hmm. I'm gonna re I'm gonna glean new information possibly sure. from that article or that book because now I have experience that will enable me to finally understand what that artist was trying to convey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, basic good instruction doesn't change. Because hmm. you know, and, and so I, I am very fond of going back to the basics with my cello. I always go back to the box suites when I need to ground myself and yeah. work on things. Right. I always go back to box, right. and it's kind of the same way with my paintings. And okay. I reach that three quarter point though, knowing when to finish is almost um, a, an art form in itself yeah. because I reach a point where all of those major players are in there. Yeah. I don't have anything obvious that I want to put in. And by the way, if it doesn't need to be in your painting, leave it out because simpler is better. You have mm. more impact. Mm -hmm. I do a That's lot of simplification point. with my work. But I start looking and feeling my way, creeping forward because I would much rather stop short of my, my supposed finish line than sure. to overwork something. Than to overwork. Oh, yeah, I, that's I, what I don't I care what the medium yeah. is. You know, and some are less forgiving than others. Like watercolor, you can always pretty much tell if somebody's gone in and tried to. That's it. That's very, very yes. difficult. It can yeah. be done, but it's difficult. So I would rather stop short and and just say, as they always say in books and, and other interviews, you know, to, to say what you have to say and leave it at that. Um, that's, a, that's a very, very good bit of advice. Well, really let's, well. let's turn to the, the beautiful uh, finished artwork. So we're going to readjust this just a little bit so people can see the faces again. And uh, a beautiful piece that uh, we've got here that you saw the study of. Um, but where did this come from? What what moment did this come from? Well, this is a, a bush tit, mm -hmm. and they um, usually travel around in large groups. Yes. They're very gregarious yeah. birds. I refer to that as a bird party. Uh, <laughs> they are very, very difficult to to photograph because they're moving constantly, very very quickly, and so. I was down on the Elk River, and this little bird landed right in front of me. And this is very, very unusual. I happened to have a camera in hand. It's never, that never happened. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> they know. I, I'm yeah. sure they know. But anyway, he landed right in front of me, and it was such a treat because they're such dear little birds, and it just sounds yes. like they're having such fun. And I just, I, I couldn't believe it. So anyway, I, I shut around. It almost so, looks like yeah. the bush that had a camera too. <laughs> And just take a picture of you taking you a picture. Of, yeah, <laughs> he was looking uh, at you. That's it. But it was really a lot of fun to paint this because, as you pointed out, this is you called it a big leaf mm -hmm. big that leaf we have yeah. here, and the the leaf really is that big, and the bird really is that small. Yeah, I had actually had somebody ask me that one time, but this was a lot of fun to paint because you'll see you have lost edges in here. You know that that continues up past the bird and in there, but it, it kind of that's that's a very good thing to to include. In your painting, if you can, and um, it adds a certain amount of mystery, and um, it's very satisfying to look at work that doesn't have everything explained. 
you don't need to explain everything because the viewer's eye can fill certain things in. Absolutely. So. And, you know, one of the, the things that struck me about this piece, of course, it's the light. I mean, the, the light draws your eye right to the bird. Mm -hmm. And uh, this little bird is, is having this moment for me where it's staring back at me and letting me know I am fully aware of you. Whatever you do next, I will know, and I am a lot faster than you are. <laughs> out of here. <laughs> so, yeah, so I could be out of here, but I'm going to give you this moment with me. Um, but it also, the, the leaf itself, the way that you capture that big leaf maple, has, it has this texture, this tonal quality that tells me exactly what season this is. Uh, I, I can hear this leaf. If, if I were to, you know, <laughs> find that on the ground and pick it up, I can hear the sound of it crinkling, and I can, you know, crack it apart. Um, so, so nice there. And then uh, the detail down here, how do you decide, you know, yeah, I want to add that in. That's a nice little accent piece on that branch or, you know, I mean, so you put a little a little bud or a little, little daub of green there. Was that just to create Sort of broaden the palette a little bit, or well, I want I want this to continue out as it naturally would, but I don't want the eye to continue out. So mm -hmm. you'll notice softened edges here along the very edge of the painting, and a little something to bring your eye back, mm -hmm. you know, and bring mm -hmm. you back to the bird. And you'll notice I've put in various bits of you know leaf and like yeah. Well, this here. looks, looks like salmon berry the because these yeah. are thorns here, mm -hmm. and so I don't want to touch them. <laughs> well, they come off in your so I'm stopping the eye from going off, but also this is a good point. I'm glad you brought this up because you can. I, I was looking at a piece the other day. Uh, I was going through my my sketchbook, in fact, looking for items that we might use for this. And I, there was a, a drawing that I had done of some geese on a pond, and I had t I had put a goose over on the far edge, mm -hmm. and I had developed it. It was really a great pose, and I I. I could see the line drawn down the painting, and I cut it off because my eye kept going over yeah, to that goose, pulling you away yeah, from, pulling me yeah, away from the, the focal point. So what if I really were to develop it. these further over here and make these edges sharper, it's amazing what an edge can do. Um, yes. You know, then then the eye would be drawn out of the painting and onto the next one. That's not something we want. Right. <laughs> so um, that's a good point. I'm glad you asked that. And. What were you going to say? Well, I'm looking at the time, oh, and we, we time? well, we're getting darn close, and we agreed uh, to a half an hour yes. presentation, but I feel like, gosh, now we could have gone on longer. Um, but I do want to show a couple of other pieces oh. of your work, if that's oh all right. God, so let's... Uh, I can take this, gonna, and you can get them set there. All right. right. And then, uh, so here, let's see if we can get this set up properly and yeah, bring, bring the camera up a little bit. There. So, if you want to talk just for a quick minute about this, and then uh, then we're going to give folks some information. Uh, but this is know. a red-shouldered hawk. Yes. You've probably seen them around. Yeah, absolutely. Heard them we have heard them. Yeah, yeah, I usually hear them first. We have a, a one or two pair living on our property where we live in Coquille, and I just love to listen to them. This particular bird, this is the same bird. Mm -hmm. uh, this yeah, and, and I noticed that you captured very nicely, I and mean, you can tell from these three different, I call them studies, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. that this is the same bird, same shape to the head, the eye, the beak, everything. Well, I got fairly close to him because uh, he was preoccupied with things on the pond beneath him. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and you'll yeah. see the wet feathers on his belly here. He oh, was right, right. actually diving. Like, well, he wasn't diving. He was swooping down to the water. They don't dive. But anyway, he missed a couple times and flew back to his perch. But uh, I, he, he looks like he's going to try again, though. <laughs> well, the idea of sneaking up on a bird is very funny, no matter what kind of bird it is, Yeah. especially a hawk. Right, but right. because he was preoccupied with dinner mm -hmm. plants, um, I was able to get fairly close. And I, these were really enjoyable to paint all of them. This was very, very all done freehand. No pencil marks under there. It hmm. was <laughs> a lot. It took me a long time to paint this. This I particular bet. pose here, however, I have to admit, was my favorite because oh, of the eye. Yeah. I love, I can just get lost in his eye. Yeah. And actually, this is an acrylic, for those of you who are wondering about oh, the medium. Huh. Okay. The one that we had up here first, I, I failed to mention that the one we had up here first, the little bush tip, was a pastel. This one is an acrylic painted on crescent watercolor board and um, I have thinned it down quite a lot with medium and water because I want it to go on the surface like a watercolor. 
I want that translucent face. And um, I really had a lot of fun with this, and I will do more. But um, yeah, this was a very challenging piece of work. Very good. So. We're going to pull up one more here, and then we've got some information. Oh, okay. You may recognize this one. We'll bring it up a little bit closer. Uh, but this is one of my favorite all-time birds. Um, Me too. Yeah, this little character we get to hear in the woods out here at South yes. Slough. Uh, and if you come out and you take a walk, although those of you who are a long ways away, you may have to make quite a trip to get here. Uh, but this is the Pacific Wren, renamed. It was the Winter Wren. Yeah, I and, still call it the Winter Wren. Yeah, Ren. I do too. I do too. Yeah. Uh, beautiful, complex song. And uh, I wanted to, uh, I mentioned the idea of coming out here for a hike. But people could come out here Saturday if yes. they are in the area. And we have an opening mm -hmm. uh, of your show from 1 to 3 p.m., is right. that right? Here at the Interpretive Center. Uh, it's always a good time, a good time to meet the artist, a good time to see the rest of Kimberly's work, or at least what some she's... Of it. Yeah, I was going to say some <laughs> of it. I've got 21 or 22 we, pieces hanging in the gallery. So, so yeah, some, some phenomenal work. Um, I want to mention a couple of other things in closing is... Uh, as part of our 40th anniversary, we are kicking off 40 days on Facebook uh, to honor the 40 years that South Slough has been uh, in existence. So I'll turn that a little bit. Um, and so if you visit our Facebook page and you like us, uh, you will not only learn some interesting things about South Slough's history, but you'll also collect a letter each day, which adds up to a very special message. And that special message can earn you something. And ah. I'm not going to say exactly what that is. Uh, it's probably not a new Buick, but it's uh, <laughs> equally as nice. So um, uh, please visit us on Facebook or visit southsluestory.org. And I'm going to try here at the end of the broadcast to share Kimberly's website. But if this is unsuccessful, uh, let me tell you it's uh, her name. Uh, www. Well, that's not your name, but <laughs> <laughs> www.kimberlyworster. Dot com. Right. And they can see more of your work yes. there and they can get in touch with you Absolutely. if they have questions. Yes. So yes. feel free to contact me. All right. Well, I'm going to give that a shot over here. We can really thank you so thank much. Thank you. I really appreciate thank you for being willing person. to do this. Yeah. And uh, if you know anybody who didn't get a chance to see the interview today, uh, please look it up on YouTube. Uh, it will be on uh, my channel, Tom Gaskell's channel, but uh, we'll figure out a way to make it South Slew's channel. Uh, at some point, and um, yeah, so that's it for our first virtual art show. Thank you. Thank you very it's much, fun. Kimberly. Yeah, great stuff. Thank you. All right, so here we'll uh, try a, um, a screen share, and we'll go there, and then we'll go there. There we go. And in theory, our viewers now are seeing that. So. My homepage. All right. All right. So thanks again for coming. And uh, from South Slew, uh, we're off the air with the Fern and Feather Thank Art you. Show. Very much. All right. All right. All right. Uh,